You know, life is full of questions that don't have very good answers. Full of questions like that. You know, ladies, do you ever look at your husband sitting there watching football like yesterday and he's kind of staring into the distance and you cozy up next to him and you say, Honey, what are you thinking? And he says, nothing. And you say, no, I mean, you're just staring at the wall. What are you thinking right now in this moment? Ladies, he's telling the truth. (laughs) Men are perfectly content just to sit there and not think at all. So if your husband ever tells you he's thinking about nothing, he's not lying to you. He... He's probably thinking about nothing. Moms, you know what it's like to pick your children up from school after a long day and they get into the car and they shut the door and you get out of the school zone and you say, what'd you learn about at school today? What do your kids usually say? Nothing. You were there seven hours, maybe eight hours. What did y'all talk about today at school? And they say, stuff stuff. Well, that clears it up. Maybe the best one, though, we've already, we've already picked on the men, but husbands, you know, when you're trying to be real kind and chivalrous and you ask your wife, hey, sweetheart, where would you like to go to dinner tonight? She says, I don't care. You pick. So you pick, and you pull into a parking lot, and she says, you picked here? (laughs) And you say, well, you said you didn't care, and she says, well, I thought you knew me better than that. (laughs) Those are questions that don't have very good answers. And the longer you live, the more questions you come across just like that. But there's another question that has been asked for hundreds of years and it's never had a good answer. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is it That someone for their entire life, they can take care of their body. They can eat right. They can exercise. They go get checkups. They realize that their body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so they protect it. And then they come down to their 60s or 70s and they go to the doctor. And they find out that they've been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Even though they've done everything the right way. Why does that happen? Why is it that a man can work for the same company for 25 or 30 or 35 years, maybe even 40 years, right after he gets out of college, and he is a loyal employee. He gives his everything to that company, and retirement is within his grasp. And he's had all of these dreams about what it's going to be like to be a retired man and an active grandfather. And within a few months of retiring, when he's going to cash out and live the American dream, he's laid off. And he's forced to work 10 or 15 or 20 more years. And he never gets to enjoy the life that he thought he was going to have. Why does that happen? Why is it that there are hundreds if not thousands of adults in this country who are not fit to be parents, don't want to be parents. And it seems like they can get pregnant just by looking at each other. And there's this godly couple who wants so badly to be parents and to raise a child to know the Lord, and they can't get pregnant. Why is that? Why, why is it that 
this young teenage girl with the rest of her life to live. She is killed by a drunk driver. But then there's a faithful Christian who's in their 90s, who's lived a good life, and they just so desperately want to go home and be with God, but for some reason their body just won't give it up, and they watch every dollar that they've saved be depleted by the tremendous amount of cost in health care. Why is it that bad things happen to good people? I don't know. I don't have one exact reason. No one does. But this I do know from God's word. God tells us over and over and over again that if you want to survive in the troubles of this life, if you want to have a faith that will move mountains, it's going to take a lot of perseverance. It's going to have to have some grit It's going to have to have that spirit that refuses to give up. And James, the brother of Jesus, before he lays down the pen, when he writes his fabulous little epistle toward the end of the New Testament, James talks about perseverance, and he does so by remembering that great biblical hero by the name of Job. In fact, in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 10, James picks up that inspired pen and James tells this group of young Christians facing suffering. He said, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. And you have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and he is full of mercy. I'll be the first to tell you that when you read through your Bible, you're never going to find God telling you, this is why people get cancer when they've taken care of their body. And you're never going to find God telling you, this is why a young teenager is killed in a car crash. And you're never going to find God telling you, this is why your spouse leaves you after many years. Or this is why you struggle to conceive a child. Or this is why you're laid off. Or this is why you have such a hard time making the ends meet when you desperately want to follow of Jesus with your entire life. You won't find it in there. You won't. But you will find this message. If you hold on to God, you're going to make it. If you hold on to God, you're going to make it. But it's going to take everything you've got. And through our suffering, through the example of Job, we learn a lot of things. First of all, we learn that through suffering, we truly come to know God. In fact, I think it's impossible to think about suffering without thinking about Job's life. And I can't think of a better example that James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, could have used to make this real for us and real for his readers. Do you remember everything that happened in Job's life? Job lost his home, Job lost his assets, Job lost his health. Some of you in here, I'm sure, have lived through the terrible tragedy of bearing a child. Life's not supposed to work that way. Parents aren't supposed to bury kids. And as terrible as it would have been to lose a child, can you imagine losing all 10 of your children? Job had 10 kids and Job lost every one. And here's what makes no sense at all. Job had done nothing wrong. Job had done nothing to deserve it. 
In fact, his friends pull him aside and his friends said, Buddy, you've obviously messed up. <laughs> you, need to, you need to give this up. You need to curse God. Some friends. If you have people in your life who are telling you right now that you're having bad things happen because you've done something wrong or that you need to turn away from God, you need to find some different friends. Because that's not the message of God's Word. In fact, I'm convinced, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm convinced that Job never had the blessing of getting to read Job chapter 1. Job did not have a clue that God and Satan were having a conversation backstage. And that Satan was perusing through the earth with his terrible hammer, just looking for someone to take down. And God practically dared Satan. Why don't you try Job? There's no one else on earth like him. See if you can turn him. I give you free reign. And Satan accepted the challenge. And Satan did everything he could to take Job down. The book of Job is 42 chapters long, and for 37 chapters of the 42 chapters, God doesn't say a word. Job cries out, where are you? What's going on? Job is confused. Job is angry. And for 37 chapters, it is complete silence until we get to chapter 38. And God breaks his silence. And God speaks from heaven. And we can just imagine that booming voice of God saying, Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you, and you will answer me. Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. If God ever says to you, brace yourself like a man, I will question you and you will answer me. You've poked the bear. And for 37 chapters, God allowed Job to question what was going on. Chapter 38, God said, now we're going to have a conversation. Who are you to question me? What I do, when I do it, why I do it, how I do it. Tell me if you understand. And then we get to the end of the book. Job 42, verses 2 through 6. You can turn there if you like, but just listen to the realization that Job has after, after he's poked the bear. Job says, I know, Lord, <laughs> that you can do all things. I know that no plan of yours can be stopped. You asked me, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you. You shall answer me. And Job says, my ears had heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. In other words, this is no longer a hearsay relationship. I no longer believe just because of what someone else told you about me. But now I have seen the Lord my God face to face. In real life. And I know what he's like. You see, through suffering, Job's relationship with God changed. 
it changed. He came to know God in a completely different way. Isn't that exactly what the Apostle Paul was trying to describe? Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Paul said, you know, I really want to know Christ. And knowing Christ is more valuable to me than anything else. But Paul also said, for me to know Christ, I have to share in the fellowship of his suffering. For me to truly know Christ, there's going to be some hard times in my life. I am convinced, church, I am convinced that we will never truly be able to understand what it really means to follow Jesus until we have some tragedy in our life. You don't know what it means to follow Jesus when everything's going well. You don't know what it means to follow Jesus when your business is thriving, when your marriage is healthy, when your children are faithful, when you don't have any problems. That's not what following Jesus is all about. But you really understand what it means to follow God when tragedy knocks on your door. In fact, that's why James would begin his book by saying, My brethren, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because those trials, they produce perseverance. And that perseverance produces a deeper faith. Through suffering, we truly come to know God. And you know why it works that way? It's because God ministers to the brokenhearted. The reason that we come to know God through suffering is because God ministers to the brokenhearted. I love what King David wrote, Psalm 34, verse 18. David said that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and the Lord saves those who are crushed in spirit. Do you think David knew what it was like to have a broken heart? Do you think David knew what it was like to have a crushed spirit? What about losing a child that you prayed for a week God would not take because of your own adultery? What about watching your own son Absalom desperately try to steal the throne right out from under your nose and take your own life? What about watching the kingdom that you were in charge of rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall many times because of the own poor choices that you had made? David was no stranger to suffering. David understood what it was like to have a broken heart and a crushed spirit. And David said, the Lord does his best work when we are in the worst place. You see, there is no tragedy where God is not only present, but where God is ministering to his people. Which means in the hospital room when you're holding your loved one's hand and you watch that monitor go flat, and you know that their life on this earth is over. God is present in that moment. When the boss calls you into his office and the boss says, we're going to have to let you go, you've done nothing wrong. But your time here at this company is over. God is present in that moment. Parents, when your adult children show up on your door one day and they say, we no longer believe in God, and you are crushed, God is present in that moment. When you have waited for so many years to have a child, and the baby's finally born, but the baby is stillborn. 
And you don't get to take the baby home to the nursery that's prepared for the child. And all you can do is weep. God is present in that moment. When your family is turned on its head in the heartbreak of divorce, in the jaws of addiction, in the thick and terrible calamity of abandonment. God is present in that moment and God is ministering to his people and God is doing some of his very best work. The absence or the presence of hardship does not mark the absence of God. The presence of hardship does not mark the absence of God. God is still close by and God is still ministering to his people. That is exactly how it worked for Jesus. You know, the prophet Isaiah wrote a lot about Jesus 750 years before Jesus ever came to earth. In Isaiah 53, even though Isaiah probably didn't know what he was writing about, Isaiah told us what was going to happen to Jesus when Jesus got here. Isaiah used words like despised and rejected and a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, stricken, pierced. All of those things were going to happen to Jesus. And Jesus wasn't just a good man. Jesus was a perfect man and bad things still came into his life. But even for Jesus... Even for Jesus, because of the suffering that he endured, his relationship with God changed. Even Jesus was promoted. When John begins his gospel, John chapter 1 verse 1, John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They were together there in the beginning, almost as if they were equals but after Jesus lives and after Jesus dies, the writer of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. Even Jesus received a higher place because Jesus suffered. And if it worked that way for Jesus who had done nothing wrong, why would it be any different for us? You remember in 2 Corinthians 12 when three times Paul prays that God would remove the thorn from his flesh? God says, no, no, no. Paul hears, my grace is sufficient for you. For Paul to really understand that God's grace was sufficient for him, Paul had to have the thorn in his flesh first. In Acts 7, Stephen is being stoned because he is so boldly preached about Jesus. And while he is being stoned, while he is being killed, Jesus looks up into heaven and Jesus sees, or Stephen sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It's the only time in Scripture we see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen got to see that, but it took Stephen being stoned to have that vision. And for us to grow in our faith, for us to experience God and see God in new and different ways, we're going to have to have some suffering in our life. I want to close today by telling you a story about a man named Horatio Spafford. You've probably heard this story before, but Horatio Spafford was the author of the great hymn that we sing, It Is Well With My Soul. That song has a fabulous story behind its message. Horatio Spafford was a very successful lawyer in the Chicago area. He owned a lot of real estate. They had a beautiful home right on Lake Michigan. And the great fire of Chicago toward the end of the 1800s wiped all of it out. And Spafford's family was left destitute, but they owned some property at another location. And so Spafford told his wife and four daughters, 
You guys get out of town for a few days, go relax, get your mind off this. I will join you in a couple of days. I have some business meetings to take care of here in Chicago. So Spafford's wife and four daughters, they boarded a vessel and they set out across the lake to go to their destination to get away. This was wartime. And while they were on the boat, an enemy vessel sank the boat carrying Spafford's wife and four daughters and many other passengers. Spafford's four daughters drowned. And somehow Spafford's wife was able to swim to safety. And upon arriving on land, she sent the dark telegram to her husband. It was only four words. I alone am saved. I alone am saved. Which meant all four of our baby girls, they're gone. In one week, Spafford lost his family, his home, everything he knew about life. A couple days later, Spafford got on a boat to sail off and meet his wife, who was obviously grieving. The boat traveled the same route that the boat carrying Spafford's wife and daughters a couple days before had traveled. And the captain of that vessel, out of respect for Spafford, who was on the ship, and others, he stopped their vessel at the exact place where Spafford's four daughters had drowned just a couple of days before. And Spafford grabbed a pen and grabbed some paper and he walked up to the railing of the ship and he looked down at the very place where his daughters had drowned. And he wrote the words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. I'm sure that you love this great hymn. What you may not have known is for this song to be written, there had to be a shipwreck. For this song to be sung in the church, there had to be some suffering. And as we finish today, if, if you'll allow me, I've already asked John Scott and he agreed. Let's just sing this song together. When peace like a river <laughs>
I do know, the hard times, they'll bring you closer to God and you will love him and appreciate him so much more. God ministers to the brokenhearted. If we can help you in any way, if we can pray for you, if you'd like to put the Lord on today in baptism, we would be most honored. If we can help you in any way, please come forward as we sing this last song together.